Hi. Good afternoon. Happy Friday. Uh, thanks for being here today. I know we don't usually do briefings on a Friday, so appreciate uh, you adjusting your schedules. Um, so first, uh, starting off, I'd like to acknowledge the end of a successful week of the NATO summit. As you know, Secretary Austin had engagements throughout the week with his counterparts, including bilateral engagements and hosting a dinner for defense ministers on Wednesday evening. This week, we celebrated NATO's historic achievements during the 75 years since its establishment and further deepened our bonds with our NATO allies and other partners. We also reaffirmed our commitment to supporting Ukraine in its fight for freedom from Russian aggression. In support of that commitment, the department announced yesterday the 61st Presidential Drawdown Authority Package, which has an estimated value of $225 million. This package will provide Ukraine additional capabilities to meet its most urgent needs and includes one Patriot battery, munitions for rocket systems and artillery, and anti-tank weapons. For a complete listing of the PDA's contents, I would direct you to defense.gov. Separately, this morning, Secretary Austin also spoke by phone with Russian Minister of Defense Andrei Belusov. During the call, the Secretary emphasized the importance of maintaining lines of communication amid Russia's ongoing war against Ukraine. The last time Secretary Austin spoke with his Russian counterpart was on June 25th, 2024, and later today a brief readout of the call will be posted to defense.gov. And finally, I'd like to provide an update on the temporary peer, or the joint logistics over the shore capability that has been used to surge humanitarian assistance into Gaza. On Wednesday, U.S. Central Command personnel attempted to re-anchor the temporary pier to the beach in Gaza to resume humanitarian operations. However, due to technical and weather-related issues, CENTCOM personnel were unable to re-anchor the pier to the shore. The pier, support vessels, and equipment returned to Ashdod and will remain there for now. A re-anchoring date has not yet been set at this time. To date, more than 8,000 metric tons, or nearly 20 million pounds of humanitarian aid, have been delivered from the pier to the marshalling area where it can be collected for, by humanitarian organizations for onward delivery and distribution. As we said when we first announced this, the pier is part of a comprehensive response to the humanitarian situation in Gaza. In addition to enabling the delivery of life-saving aid, implementation of JLOTS has been enabled has enabled the development of Cyprus as a port for inspections and deliveries directly into Gaza. Aid can now be inspected in Cyprus and delivered directly into Gaza through Israel's Ashdod port and crossings in the north. The deployment of this pier has also helped secure Israeli commitment to opening additional crossings into northern Gaza. Since the opening of these crossings, we've seen more trucks moving from Jordan directly into northern Gaza to help allevi alleviate the dire humanitarian conditions. As we announced yesterday, the pier will soon cease operations, with more details on that process and timing available in the coming days. We're very proud of our service members and all those supporting this effort and who have enabled vital humanitarian assistance to get in to, to those in Gaza who need it most. Without a doubt, lives have been saved because of their work and commitment under very challenging conditions. And as hundreds of thousands of people continue to face emergency levels of food insecurity across Gaza, the United States will continue to take all possible action to ensure increased aid flows are sustained at the scale needed to meet the needs on the ground. As we've said from the beginning, DOD will continue to work closely with USAID and others in the Middle East region to support these important efforts. And with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. I believe we have AP joining us on the phone today, so I'll turn it over to Tara Kopp. Hi, Sabrina. Thanks for doing this. Um, so just on the pier, you said no decision has been made on it, but it sounds like it might just be too much between the sea states and the small amount of aid left to make it uh, make sense to reattach. Is, is that kind of the deliberations that you guys are going through right now? Thanks, Tara, for the question. So certainly, um, sea states environmental factors are going to be um, taken into consideration um, when it comes to the re-anchoring. Um, again, as I said at the top, a re-anchoring date has not been set at this time. Um, when and if that does happen, we'd be, of course, uh, certainly to keep you updated on that front. And did you have another one? I do, a couple. Um, so, but is one of the options you're thinking is just at this point, because the weather is going to get worse and you've never really been intending to have it 
last later in the summer anyway, that this might be the end of the pier. Yeah, so, yeah, appreciate the question. Again, can't predict the weather. Um, it's something that we are assessing uh, day by day. Uh, we know for the next few days there are going to be higher sea states that would not allow a re-anchoring to be possible. Um, again, at this time, uh, I just don't have more information to provide on when and if a re-anchoring date um, has been or will be possible. If a re-anchoring does happen, of course, as we always do, we would read that out to you. And anything additional? And then I'll come in the room. Just one last. Um, does the Pentagon have any... Uh of its own intelligence corroborating that Russia tried to um, assassinate arms makers, Western arms makers who are assisting with the effort in Ukraine. And was this brought up in Austin's call with his counterpart? Uh, thanks, Tar, for the question. In terms of um, any further details on the call, I'm just not going to be able to provide that on at this time. Um, I think what you're referring to is, um, uh, I've seen some of those reports. Uh, of course, we always, with any of our allies and partners um, always share intelligence and information, but I just don't have more to add at this time as well. I'll come in the room. Warren. One pure question and then one question on a call with the Russian counterpart. Uh, whose decision was it to, to end or not extend the peer operation? Is that a General Kirilla decision? Is that is that SECDEF or is that the president? And when was that decision made? To, I'm sorry, to, to end? To so as we, as we always said, the, the peer is temporary. Um, a decision, it's not just one person, it is a collective decision that is made. And of course, a recommendation comes up from the commander all the way up to the secretary. Um, we always said that this peer was temporary. And given the um, sea states, the weather conditions that we know were always going to get worse throughout the summer, um, the the mission of the pier will be concluding at, at some time soon, but I just don't have an exact date for you. And then on the call with the Russian counterpart, with Minister Belusov, mm -hmm. um, this is now two calls in two and a half weeks. Mm -hmm. Was this was this one also initiated by Secretary Austin? And, and it certainly seems like these are more common than they've been over the course of two and a half years, of the last two and a half years. Is, is this to be expected to continue? Will there be a more regular pace of of discussions here between the two? This call was initiated by the Russian Minister of Defense. Um, in terms of future calls, uh, you know, of course, nothing to announce. But as the Secretary has said, and um, what I also mentioned at the top, is that uh, maintaining lines of communication is incredibly important right now. Um, and so if there are future calls, we'd, we'd read those out as well. And was there any specific reason given about Yeah, why? I just don't have any more to provide at this time. Thanks, Sabrina. Uh, President Zelensky has insisted that lifting all restrictions so you, Ukraine can strike military targets within Russia would be a, quote, game changer, and that Ukraine needs to hit those targets and able to win. Um, what's the Pentagon's assessment of that? So I think the president spoke to this um, uh, very directly yesterday at his press conference. Um, our policy hasn't changed. Uh, we do allow those cross-border strikes when Russia is attacking uh, from the other side of the border. And as the war has changed, um, we have changed, our policies have adapted. Um, and you've seen that play out in Kharkiv and it could expand into other areas. But right now, um, we have not authorized the use of attackums for deep, stri deep strike capabilities within Russia. Um, and I have to remind you, they have other long-range capabilities that are not provided the United States. Um, but in terms of our policy, that has not changed. So, so what's this coming from then? Because throughout the week at the NATO summit, Zelensky was pretty adamant yeah. um, that this is a game changer. Uh, so, so, so is that just not true? Look, of, of, of course, you're going to advocate on behalf of your country. Uh, you know, we don't take any issue with that. Uh, our policy still remains the same. Uh, we believe that Ukraine continues to be successful in the battlefield. With our policy in place, we've been able to see them hold and strengthen their lines around Kharkiv. Um, could our policy, could they be allowed to use it into other areas? Um, we're always adapting. And as the war has changed, um, our policy has changed. Um, but of course, we are always mindful of escalation. And that's something that um, is the reason why we have the policy the way it is. Constantine. Thanks, Sabrina. Um, you mentioned, uh, you sort of said that if the peers are re-anchored mm -hmm. twice, is there a world where 
the re-anchoring attempts are scrubbed and this is the, you know, the pier has done the last work it, it will do? It really depends on the sea states and the environment. And right now, obviously, I can't predict that. Um, what we are committed to is making sure that every single piece of aid, metric ton of aid that is in Cyprus is moved into Gaza. Um, so whether that be through the port of Ashdod or through the temporary pier, no matter what, the aid that was assembled um, will get to the people who need it most. And can you just speak a little bit more into the uh, about the decision making process in turn to cease operations? Was that because of these challenges with the sea state and the environmental factors, or was it because aid in in uh, Cyprus is dwindling and nearing? you know, sort of the end of that? Well, I think it's important to remember that we always said this was a temporary operation. It was always going to have an end date. Um, that exact end date, you know, I, I don't have for you right now, but we'll keep you updated on that. Um, I think it's also really important to remember that during the course of um, the time that JLOTS has been operating, you know, we acknowledge that there have been um, bumps in the road. We have had to take it offline. There have been repairs that needed to be made, but you cannot discount the fact that we were able to get nearly 20 million pounds of aid into Gaza um, and for onward distribution. We got it in, of course, to the marshalling area. Um, that aid is going to save lives. So I think it's important to remember that um, in the context of the temporary pier, uh, one, it was always going to have an end date. Two, we're working on other avenues in, in, in ways with USAID to get aid into Gaza. And then three, of course, um, this was always going to be a temporary uh, method. Um, I will go back to the phones and then happy to come back into the room here. Um, Idris, Reuters. Yeah, two quick questions. Um, the White House uh, earlier this week announced some long range fires being moved to Germany, um, sort of, you know, on and off and then eventually being placed there in 2026. Um, what's the message the U.S. Is, is trying to send with those long range fires in Germany? And secondly, the announcement was made by the White House. Unless I've missed something, the Pentagon has not put anything out on that. Is, is, is there a new policy that the White House is going to announce force posture movements, not the Pentagon? If you could give any more details on that. Uh, thanks, Idris. Well, you know, the president uh, was leading the NATO summit uh, this week. Um, he announced it. We, of course, when uh, rotations happen, uh, we do announce that either in a statement or, or uh, you know, reading it out from the podium. Uh, but again, as you mentioned, this is not something that's happening until 2026. Um, so give us a little time here. Um, as, as you also mentioned, these are um, episodic deployments and will help inform planning for ensuring future um, stationing. Um, and we are, you know, in terms of the message that it sends, uh, we are working in close collaboration with the German government and the army to continue to finalize these details. Um, but it is about shoring up support um, within Europe. And that's something that not only you saw with this announcement, but with what the president um, and the secretary in their engagements uh, with NATO, um, with their counterparts at the NATO summit all this week. Um, OK, I'll take another one from the phone here. Uh, Jeff Shogel, Task and Purpose. Thank you very much. And I stand with all the Military Times reporters and Sightline Union reporters laid off today. I understand if you have to take this question, when the president said that U.S. and Chinese military leaders now have direct access, did he mean there's now a, a hotline uh, between U.S. and Chinese leaders or that mill-to-mill uh, -mill communications have reset to a time before uh, Speaker Pelosi visited Taiwan? Thank you. Thanks, Jeff, for the question. I don't have to take that question. I would refer you to the White House to speak more to the president's comments. Uh, last question, uh, Jeff Selden, VOA. Sabrina, thanks. The, the UN this week issued a report on Afghanistan, and it indicated Al Qaeda is sending more operatives there and opening new training camps. It also said that ISIS K has managed to infiltrate some of the Taliban ministries and also push into Central Asia and is even running a special ops force in Iran. How concerned is the Pentagon about Al Qaeda and ISIS K operations out of Afghanistan? And, and what, if anything, at this point, is the Pentagon doing to push back? As a second unrelated question, has the Pentagon been impacted at all by the AT&T breach that was disclosed? If so, what is the Pentagon doing to mitigate? Uh, thanks, Jeff, for the question. Um, on the AT&T breach, I'm, I'm not aware of an impact to the department, but of course, this is developing in real time. So um, if there is an impact, we you know we can let you know on that. Um, when it comes to ISIS-K um, and just the proliferation of 
um, you know, ICE is not just in Afghanistan, but you're seeing also um, throughout Africa. It is something, of course, that remains top of mind for the United States, which is why uh, you have our mission in Iraq and Syria to continue that that fight against ISIS. Uh, it's something that we continue to monitor, um, and whether it be from AFRICOM or CENTCOM, uh, it's something that we take very seriously. So, of course, we're concerned with, with any proliferation of any uh, plots or plans against um, U.S. service members or our partners and allies around the world, and it's something that we're going to continue to watch. All right, I'll come back in the room here. Uh, yes, and then I'll come over to you, Seth. Yeah. Uh, you said that the surge of aid had saved lives. It's estimated that the amount that was unloaded into the marshalling area was the equivalent of one day of pre-war aid delivery into Gaza. Off of that, then, do you know how much actually reached the people off Gaza? Who, whose lives were saved? How many? So for, in terms of, um, so maybe I can explain to you our role in distributing an aid and then what USAID's role and WFP and, and the UN is. So what we have done is facilitating the aid getting into the marshalling area in Gaza. Once it gets to the marshalling area, it gets distributed out by WFP or contracted drivers that USAID has been in close coordination with. It goes into dr distribution centers within Gaza and then gets further distributed out. I don't have a count for you of how many lives have been saved, but what I can tell you is that people are hungry there are people in need of that food. And we delivered nearly 20 million pounds of food to the people in Gaza. So we are saving lives. I think it's important to remember that. And um, what you saw with our forces is running towards the problem. We created a solution. We believe it was a success. Just one other follow-up. Did, sure. did, did anyone at the Pentagon research summer Mediterranean sea conditions before embarking? on this project. There's a sense that you were taken but completely by surprise. And in fact, the JLOTS is completely unsuitable for the conditions off the coast of Gaza. So um, we are a planning organization. We have uh, folks all around the world that uh, operate uh, within the Eastern Med at any given time. Of course, we are aware of the sea conditions within the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, we are not shying away from the fact that there have been higher sea states that have um, at times disrupted delivery of aid and have made it harder to get aid in. But I, again, I would say uh, to you and on, on some of these questions, to do nothing would have been a failure. To be part of a solution, that's success. And that's what you saw with our personnel delivering that aid into Gaza. Well, there have been inquiry now as to where this $230 million of taxpayer money actually went and whether it was worth it and the decision-making process behind it. I think it was worth uh, feeding people who needed it most. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, Aaron, and then I'm coming over here. Kind of a follow-up. Sure. How many days has the pier been functioning, like getting aid off uh, the pier onto land? I, I believe, believe it's a total. I believe it's a total of twenty days since it was anchored on um, uh, in, in mid-May. That it's taken food off of the pier and delivered it onto shore. Twenty days total. Mm -hmm. Well. Two separate things. So the functionality of the pier, it's been operable for a, a, about 20 days. You have to remember that aid started to move when we moved the pier back into Ash, uh, uh, a few weeks ago back to Ashdod. There were those contracted drivers that started moving aid out of the marshalling area into distribution centers because the marshalling area was essentially at capacity. So that was happening while aid was not moving off the pier because there was essentially, um, you know, it was it was pretty full, but it, you know, there wasn't a, a, a need to necessarily move aid in at a rapid pace. Great. Yes. Thank you. How does the Department of Defense of the United States uh, see the current sec security situation in Western Balkan, primarily and Kosovo and Metohia? In this sense, how the Washington uh, see military cooperation and communication with Serbian authorities uh, about to preserve stability and security partnership and the uh, prospect for improving cooperation? First, I should have said welcome. I believe we have some folks joining us from abroad. Uh, and I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Marko Ivo Stanjuk, Serbia. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today. Um, so, look, we acknowledge that um, our, our two countries, there's been increased mill to mill cooperation and are on track for over 100 military to military events in 2024. Um, that's a nearly 25% increase from last year. 
And that includes uh, bilateral training, multilateral exercises like Platinum Wolf that I think you've covered, and high-level visits between both nations. Um, Serbia, Serbia's um, active cooperation with NATO is also a cornerstone of our defense relationship, enab enabling the Serbian Armed Forces valuable contributions to global security through participation in numerous EU and UN uh, peacekeeping missions. So we're going to continue to further deepen our cooperation um, and uh, through you know, mutually beneficial bilateral, multilateral exercises. The current situation in West Balkan primarily calls from Antokia. So we acknowledge that there certainly are tensions within um, the Western Balkan region, and in in, certainly over the past two years. Um, this heightened concern certainly underscores uh, our ongoing cooperation and partnership in ensuring regional stability. So we're going to continue to monitor that. Rio, and then I'll happily come to you. Oh, thank you, Sabrina. Yeah. My question is about Japan. So there are some media reports that the U.S. Navy's Ospreys will be deployed at the U.S. base in Iwakuni, Japan, for the first time. So could you please confirm the report? And also, this month, DOD has announced its modernization plan to upgrade U.S. tactical airplanes in Japan. So is the potential deployment of Navy's Ospreys in Japan related to this DOD's aircraft modernization? Plan. I'm so sorry, Rio. I'm just not going to have a ton for you right now. Um, I haven't seen that report that you referenced, so I just really can't comment on that. Um, we're always looking to looking for ways to modernize our, our forces, but I just don't have anything more to add to, to what you had asked. I'm, I'm so sorry. We're, we're happy to get back to you on that. Yes. Biljan Obradović, Republika Srpske Telegraf. I am from Serbia. So my okay. question will be about uh, S Serbia. Can we expect some hardware procurements from USA and what can be done in that direction between two countries? So as Serbia continues to modernize its military, we believe that the preferred option for procurement would be NATO interoperable equipment and systems. Um, this aligns with Serbia's goals um, and presents significant advantages. And you're seeing that also, um, you know, as we're continuing to arm Ukraine, it's it's about, you know, NATO interoperability, which is incredibly important. Um, and so while U.S. and European equipment may require a higher initial investment, it ensures right now the long-term benefits through streamlined training, maintenance, and interoperability. Great. Yes. Hi. Uh, please, uh could you explain uh, is uh, uh, something about uh, Western Balkans too? Because I am from Serbia too, journalist for uh, Kurir. Uh, is Bosnia and Herzegovina or Kosovo and Metohija greater security risk in the Western Balkans? So as I mentioned before, um, you know, we're certainly aware of the heightened tensions within the Western um, Balkans, and we believe that stability and security is vital. Um, you know, both Kosovo, Bosnia, Herzegovina, um, they each face distinct challenges. And so our role is that we are committed to supporting their paths to greater cooperation and prosperity, and we're going to continue to work um, closely on that. Okay, yes, and then I'll come to Louis. Thank you. Um, Japan's Defense Ministry announced today, um, actually yesterday in Japan, uh, must discipline including the uh, personal personal who treated classified information improperly. Um, is there serious concern in the Pentagon, especially when US and Japan have been trying to uh, construct a robust system of information sharing? Um, look, I, I'd refer you to Japan to speak more to you know the security measures that they're, they are taking. I, I saw that report as well. Um, we have confidence in our relationship with the Japanese government and our, and our militaries. Um, you know, I'd refer you to them to speak more to how they are enhancing their security measures. Um, but as you saw, we had had and continue to have great engagements. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, Louis, and then I'll come in the back. Uh, thank you. I have uh, two questions. One, I want to follow up on Constantine's question. Sure. Um, so you're saying that as of right now, the, you're looking to see whether the JLOTS pier could be operational yet again. Um, are, are alternate methods? being looked at um, for potentially delivering some of that aid uh, from Cyprus that you mentioned, should that uh, not be the case? And I'm kind of framing it as a hypothetical, but you know, I, I'm sure that since you said this is a planning organization. Yeah. yeah. No, I and I, sorry if uh, maybe you, um, I don't know if you heard uh, me at the, at the top, but I had mentioned that one of the, um, 
ways we are looking to get aid in into Gaza is through the port of Ashdod. Um, you know, it, it's sort of a in, in its proof of concept um, stages right now. Uh, we are looking. I mean, what I can tell you is every metric ton that is on Cyprus or on one of our ships will be delivered in some way into Gaza. But we are looking for those alternative methods. And once we have better fidelity, I will, you know, of course, keep you updated on that. So that leads me to my next question. Sure. So you established those cells um, under General Frank um, mm -hmm. at, um, <coughs> at the air base there in uh, Israel. Is that functionality end with, the, does that mission end uh, if the JLATS pier, and when the JLATS pier ends on July 31st? Or does it continue in a different frame, kind of what you're talking about through Ashdod? Um, well, again, speculative and, and not not exactly there yet. Um, the the short answer is I think there will be continued cooperation and coordination with the Israeli government to making sure that humanitarian aid is getting in. Um, what that looks like without the pier being, you know, when it, when it eventually um, ends, and you know that will be soon. But I again don't have an exact date. Um, I don't know how. You know, coordination will shift in those cells. Um, but again, it's it, it, we are still going to continue to talk and work with the Israelis on making sure that aid is getting in. And if aid is getting in through our ships through Ashdod, of course, that cell coordination um, link is going to have to exist in some way. And so it very might well be through that cell. So does that mean that um, American vessels may be transporting this, uh, you know, these shipments from Cyprus in the future beyond the JLAS mission. It, that's exactly what we we're working through right now. Um, this is again a proof of concept to try and get aid in through Ashdod and then move it down into Gaza. Um, we're working that through with the Israeli government. When we have more, we'll certainly share. Whether that involves U.S. ships or commercial ships, I'll keep you updated. Yes, in the back. So, Jerusalem is Gen One TV, which is a CNN affiliate in the Western Balkans. Oh. Um, yeah, you just mentioned that Serbia is sending arms to Ukraine. Do you know what type of ammunition? Um, I know I didn't mention that I was talking about NATO interoperability. Um, so I, I don't have anything for you on that. I'd let Serbia speak to their assistance. About that. Uh, mm -hmm. There was an article in Financial Times that Serbia is sending arms to Ukraine, which uh, Serbian government denies, uh, and uh, also saying that it's uh, forbidden to transport arms through the third uh, third countries. Uh, but it's obvious that Serbia is producing calibers which are very similar to Russians, which can be used um, um, in all the uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, military equipment. So how do you assess that? Do you have any assessment on that? Uh, so appreciate the question, but that's really something that the Serbian government would have to speak to. I, I am not, as you are here in the briefing room, I am the spokesperson for the Department of the Defense today uh, up here uh, answering your questions. I would just sort of have to refer you to the Serbian government for more on that. Did I see one more? Yes. yes thank you. Uh, U.S. Secretary Blinken announced on NATO summit two days ago that first F-16 are en route to Ukraine. Can you confirm that? And how many planes we're talking about? I mean, I certainly can. The Secretary uh, Secretary of State confirmed that. Um, I'm just not going to get into specific numbers. Um, I would certainly let the Ukrainians speak to that. Um, and, and when they are in country, that's um, always... Um, something that we've traditionally done with any presidential drawdown package. We announce some of the equipment, the systems, the capabilities that we are sending, but we do let the Ukrainians speak to when they are in country, as that is an operational security consideration that they have to take into account. Um, and so I, I'd refer you to the Ukrainians to speak to that. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for joining us for those that are coming from abroad. Yeah.